I am Dr. Andy Johnson. We are looking at behavior learning theory and the specific applications in the classroom of this learning theory. Remember, a theory is a way to explain a set of facts. Each theory explains different facts differently. Behavioral learning says learning is a change in behavior that occurs as a result of an experience. Behavioral learning theory is not concerned with what goes on inside the head. They care nothing of neural networks or cognitive files or schemas. They are only concerned with behavior and changing behavior at its basis. Classical conditioning is when two stimuli are paired together many times, so many times that they produce the same result. For example, Sour milk in a buzzer. Sour milk produces this ug, nauseous feeling. Pair them together enough times and the buzzer will give you the same response as the spoiled milk. That is classical conditioning in a nutshell. Both produce the same response. Emotions can become classically conditioned. Old Dr. John Watson with his little Albert experience showed that this can happen. He uh, classically conditioned Albert to experience fear. As teachers, we want to make sure that our classrooms, our schools, do not become associated with negative emotions. Fear, humiliation, frustration, boredom, shame, despair. These are often associated with schools, especially with students with who are struggling learners, especially students who are dealing with emotions and behaviors. We use shame and, dis you know, we, we do these things and they begin to associate school with these negative emotions. Research shows that positive emotions enhance learning, negative emotions impede learning. Therefore, attending to the emotional element can be considered a research-based strategy. So negative emotions related to learning difficulties. Think about it when students are frustrated, they, they uh, are failing, they have these negative emotions. Put yourself in their position. Would you be motivated to do something that you could not do, in which you failed in a very public way? Of course not. So how do we deal with negative emotions related to learning difficulties? Number one, teach within the zone of proximal development. That's the zone just above students' independent level, below the frustration level, where they can learn or complete a task with scaffolding or the teacher's help, just above their independent level. And of course, that means you have to know what this level is. You have to know your students, what they can do. You don't want to frustrate your students. That's not good teaching. Explaining complex stuff is not good teaching. Good teaching is taking complex stuff and bringing it down to the level of your students. And yes, absolutely anything can be taught at any level if it's broken down into the developmentally appropriate level. Zone of proximal development. However, students are not standardized products, are they? Nope. So what do you do? Even in a resource room, a gifted room, what you think is the most homogeneous classroom? No, students are not at the same level. So you have to have some sort of multi-level teaching strategies. And these are universal design for learning, workshop approaches, contract learning, tiered instruction. These are just some of them, but these are ways to differentiate a common curriculum so all students can learn and be successful in different ways. Multi-level teaching strategies wherever you're at. Number three, use homework to practice learning, not to challenge students, not to get a wide dispersal of scores, Students should be able to complete this with 95 to 100% success ratio. Homework is used to practice learning, not to challenge or to measure learning. It should be practice. You should call it learning practice instead of homework. 
Number four, provide time in class to begin learning practice. All right? This enables the teacher to act as a scaffold to walk around to see how students are doing. And I would say in a 60-minute class, it's reasonable to teach for 50 minutes and allow 20 minutes at the end for homework. Remember, students can't stay engaged for a long time. And again, depending on the level. Depending on the level. Everything is adopted and adapted to the students and the level. Students are not standardized products. You can't say, when this happens, do that. You can provide suggestions at best. Not everything needs to be graded. Use grading judiciously. When I first started teaching, I thought, well, I'm going to be a good teacher. I'm going to grade and record everything the students do. And I have all these nice, lovely numbers to show parents at parent teaching conference. Baloney. I was in, I was a boo-boo bunny head. Grading is like taking soil samples. You don't dig up the whole lawn to see what kind of soil you have. You take little samples here and there. Grading. Take little bits of information here and there to see how students are doing. And try to catch them learning instead of failing, instead of not doing their homework. Try to catch them learning. Remember, students have a natural inclination to learn. Yes, it's a natural human thing to want to learn, to want to find out about the world. But why don't they learn? Oftentimes, they're made to learn things that are that's irrelevant to them, that's boring, or made to learn in ways that are not developmentally appropriate. Recognize normality. It's normal to have average, above average, and below average. That's what average is. It's normal to have students learn at different rates and in different ways. That's normal. It's unrealistic to expect all students to be at grade level or above. Now, sometimes teachers think, well, I have to have this student reading at the third grade level since he or she is in fifth grade. I need to set an IEP goal of fifth grade reading at the end of, no, absolutely not. That's not what, uh, uh, that's not what the IEP regulations say, by the way. All right. It is, malpractice, educational malpractice, to insist or put to, to put a goal on an IEP that a student is going to improve two grade levels in one year? No. That doesn't mean that we give up on struggling learners. Far from it. We need our most expert, experienced teachers dealing with struggling learners, with struggling readers. It means we have to recognize what's called normal. Put as much emphasis as we can. Help them help all students learn in ways that uh, they can learn best. Recognize normality. We all learn differently. Help them discover their strengths instead of finding their weaknesses. That's what we often do in special ed. We find what students can't do, and then we focus on what they can't do, so they get all up, up tight and they can't do it even more. Recognize growth and improvement. Instead of achievement test scores, set goals. Celebrate when students meet their goals, knowing that each student is going to have different goals. For one student, it may be reading 17 books this quarter. For another student, it may be two. But set different goals and celebrate different goals. By the way, contract grading is a great multi-level teaching strategy that does just that. Use strategies to reduce test anxiety, as well as um, allow for multiple ways for students to demonstrate their learning. Testing is one way for students to demonstrate their learning. Testing of any kind, however, is just a snapshot. Ideally, you want to include a portfolio assessment where students can uh, include products that they have created over time. But that's another subject. All right, what do you do with negative emotions related to learning content? You got to learn this stuff. Oh my gosh, I don't like it. It's boring. It's too hard for me. Know that negative emotions relating to learning something, content, can occur when students are asked to learn things they have no desire to learn. How are you, are, 
Are you motivated to learn something that holds no interest to you? Or to learn things that are irrelevant, that are not connected to their lives in any way, or to learn in ways that are not developmentally appropriate? Yes, you're going to create these negative emotions. And yes, students are going to be classically conditioned to begin to hate school. Does everything have to be fun and exciting? No, but everything doesn't have to be boring and dull and irrelevant as well. The master teacher knows how to connect required content to students' lives and make it interesting. Remember, all human beings have a natural inclination to learn. We do things in our schools to squash this natural inclination. We have to figure out what that is. Choice is one way to uh, address the negative emotions related to, uh, uh, to content. This would be choice of content. Now, this doesn't mean total choice all the time. It means some choices some of the time. It could be choices within a required topic or choices of book to read, but allow some choices some of the time. Some choice. Choice of content to delivery. Then again, it depends on the age. Boys and girls, how would you like to learn this? Mini lectures, small group instruction. You see these ideas here, and there's many more. Internet video learning centers. Allow for choice. And don't try to do all of these. Pick one or two of these ideas and say, hmm, I like this choice idea. I think I'm going to experiment with that. Experiment. See what works. Choice of activities. An activity would be homework to practice learning. And assessment. How do you want to demonstrate your learning? Small group speeches are great. Graphic organizer, problem-based. Short video presentation. Mini quizzes. Let's decide. And again, this doesn't mean total choice all the time, but allowing some choice some of the time. In contract grading, contract learning, students are able to decide how they're going to demonstrate their learning. This That's a great multi-level uh, strategy. So four other applications related to classical conditioning, behavioral learning theory in the classroom. The first one is immediacy. The, report, uh, the reward or the punishment that you're using to change behavior. Remember, behaviorism is concerned only with behavior. Should be distributed immediately after the behavior. To reinforce lever pressing in a mouse in a Skinner box, that pellet needs to appear right after the mouse has pressed the bar. To reinforce hand raising in children, as soon as you see someone raise their hand, you say, Molly, nice job. You raised your hand. Good job. Immediacy. As close as possible uh, to the behavior. The pre-math principle. Use what students like to do to reinforce a behavior that you want to see. A more reliable behavior can be used to reinforce less reliable behaviors. Instead of looking always for external rewards. Boys and girls, if you stay focused on your homework and for 15 minutes, I'll let you use the last five minutes to talk with your friends. I used to use that in fifth grade up to middle school because I know at that age, people like talking with their friends. That's pre mac principle. So let's use that natural inclination. Law of readiness. When an organism or a student is ready to act, it's reinforcing for it to do so and annoying for it not to do so. When a student is ready to learn, that student wants to learn. So you have to ask yourself, what are students motivated to learn or do? The master teacher knows how to align students' natural desire with what they have to learn. Learning is more powerful. Teaching is more effective when it's aligned with students' natural desire to learn about themselves and to find out about the world in which they live. So you should ask yourself, hmm, what are my students curious about? What do they want to learn? What concerns do they have in their lives? What would they like to be able to do? And of course, why not ask them a survey? And again, it doesn't have to be the whole curriculum, but things within the curriculum. If I'm studying the Civil War, I might want to ask them, hmm, what are some things you're interested in? Or 
Here are four choices. Choose the area that seems to interest you. And again, I'm allowing choice. Choice is a powerful one. Now, behavioral objectives, and we'll end with behavioral objectives. A behavioral learning theory says learning is a change in behavior that occurs as a result of an experience. Okay, so a behavioral objective is a one-sentence statement that describes the behavior you would like to see at the end of the lesson that will occur as a result of the experience. As a result of this lesson, Students will get 95% on the social studies worksheet or some such thing. At the end of this lesson, students will be able to. At the end of this video, students will be able to describe three elements of behavioral learning theory or three applications of behavioral learning theory. It's a single sentence that states the behavior you want to see at the end of the lesson. You should be able to say yes or no. Do you see the behavior? Yes, you are successful. Do you see the behavior? No, you weren't successful. That's what a behavioral objective is. Beginning teachers may need to use this, but it is extremely limited. It's a simplistic view of teaching and learning because learning is not a behavior. Learning is happening up here, a change in cognitive files and neural networks. All right. Some ideas about applying behavioral learning theories in the classroom.